I tell my clients, find a good architect. And for every hundred dollars or every thousand dollars that you spend on that architect, you will save money in the construction. Business of Architecture, episode 384. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm talking to Mike Grossfent, who is the CEO and founder of All Coast Construction, a construction company based on the West Coast of the US. Mike focuses his attention onto new construction and restorations. Um, He's worked with many world-renowned architects. He's worked with uh, an incredible array of A-list celebrities as well, including Quincy Jones, and he's recently completed the home of Robert Downey Jr. and his wife, Susan, which is based in Malibu. Quite an incredible and unusual architectural feat. He's currently working on a remodel of a 27,000 square foot home for Charles Guathamy, uh, again in Malibu. And in this conversation, Uh, Mike and I talk about his beginnings, how he began as a carpenter, how he won projects in the early days. And we get a really good insight into the workings of a construction business, how a contractor views modern construction, um, what makes a good relationship between contractor and architect. And all the different nuances of making construction profitable and the complexities of running a business and having that hand in hand compared to design services. So a really interesting and insightful interview here. So sit back, relax and enjoy Mike Grossvent. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Michael, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Excellent. Thank you, Rian. Fantastic. So you are the founder of All Coast Construction. You're based out in uh, the West Coast in Los Angeles in the US. You've got an extraordinary portfolio of work for everyone from Hollywood A-listers to people working in financial services and you know it's it's a it's a really high caliber level of construction um out of, of a lot of modernist homes as well um and your practice your business has been going for about 30 years or so and i first the first question is how did you get started well i um <clears throat> i got started uh very young, my father built two of the homes that we lived in, and uh, they were custom homes. Uh, he wasn't a home builder. It was more of a hobby for him. Uh, he was working in aerospace. But uh, he, you know, up six foot nine, two meters, um, very tall, the family small. One of the first uh, homes he built for us, the counters were unusually high. Uh, perfect for us, a little bit high for everyone else. Mm. And uh, that was my first inkling that things could be customized (laughs) to individuals. And uh, then he cut a hole in the uh, end of the counter and uh, stuck a trash can underneath it and took a lid off a pot and landed it on top. And that's where our trash would go. And it was easy to sweep uh, material into the hole. So I realized uh, I was taught about custom building early. Um, but uh, I was a bit of a wanderer, uh, got out of high school, started uh, traveling around the world, um, and um, got a job on a cruise ship as a carpenter. Um, I was good at it, so I had to sort of get more formal. Mm. Uh, we were receiving building materials all in ports all over the world, so I called the company All Coast Construction. And uh, worked on that cruise ship for a couple of years. Came back to Los Angeles. Uh, Northridge earthquake hit. Phone started ringing and never stopped. Amazing. How did you begin to distinguish yourself 
from you know and, and kind of moving into this high-end luxury or the kind of very a very refined level of quality and finish how did that progression start well i think it i think uh good contracting probably pretty much like anything else begins with a personality uh you want a personality that's uh friendly uh, open fair mm -hmm. reasonable and uh, fortunately, uh, I was, uh, I have some of those attributes. And um, my, my slot or niche in the entertainment world here came from uh, an early job I got with a uh, incredible business manager, a guy named Howard Boris. Uh, he hired me to renovate his house. Uh, we did, we had a, a successful relationship turned out well. And he started um, recommending me to his entertainment industry clients. So uh, started off with uh, Ricky Lake. Through Ricky, I met Courtney Cox. Through Courtney, I met a lot of people. Uh, mm. And it just sort of grew over the years. And we, we seem to uh, deal with a lot of people in the entertainment industry, but then we also started dealing with a lot of people in the business industry in Los Angeles, business leaders. Yeah. And uh, I've just focused on being um, a, a, a quality contractor, quality first. Uh, uh, my brother, uh, my brothers were all carpenters and uh, my brother taught me early on. Uh, they, they soon forget the money and the aggravation, but they always remember the quality. That's what they have to live with. And um, I focused on getting rid of the aggravation and um, focused on the quality. And there you go. We're off and running. Now, how would you, I mean, it's interesting, you know, architects, we all work with contractors, you know, you're, you're the, the, the fundamental into having a project actually realized, right? That relationship is a very, is a very deep one. Um, how would you describe what it is that a contractor does? Um, well, I see the relationship like a tripod. It's client, architect, or architect and designer, or designer, yeah. and builder. Those are the three legs of the tripod. Mm. Um, the architect's job, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the builder's job is to realize the vision of the architect. Typically, the architect and the owner have been in conversation long before they get to the builder. And the architect has produced a set of plans that represent the, the aspirations of the owner. <clears throat> and my job is to take those plans and turn them into reality. Uh, to uh, provide a, uh, a path forward uh, to get the uh, costing complete on the plans yep. and then execute the plans. Uh, very fundamental. Uh, I'm not an architect. I'm not a designer. Uh, I have opinions. I have intelligent opinions, but my job is to realize what what's on that piece of paper that's handed to me. Mm. Has there been times where you've been the kind of the lead of a project, for example, and that you bring in architects to the project. So a client would liaise with you, first and then it's your your job if you like to find the architect or does it typically happen where the architect is getting in communication with you first and then you're going into a tender list and then you compete for the work in that in that sense i would say that 75 percent of the time uh the architect is going to recommend three builders to the right. owner and then the owner or the owner's representatives will collect three uh prices compare them. Uh, and it's not always based on cost. A lot of it's based on uh, how, a, uh, how much work the, the contractor is doing, his availability, how much bandwidth he can dedicate to the project, uh, his areas of expertise, uh, his, his track history with uh, pricing and uh, uh, completion. And uh, so there's a lot of factors going into the final decision, but 75% of the time, the project is brought to me. Uh, I do have clients who have asked me to recommend architects and designers, 
And uh, I've been blessed to work with some of the best in yep. Southern California. And then I'll make recommendations as asked. Do you, do you find that the, the bidding process, for example, because you're always the, the kind of traditional way that it's set up where you're competing against three other contractors, has that, have you ever thought that there must be a, there must be a better way of doing this or is it, do you think it is actually the fairest way or do you ever do things like a negotiated tender where you're working with the architect from the outset and the architect says, we only want to use this contractor. What are your views on? Again, um, I do think that the bidding process is the fair process. For Mm. example, I may bid a foundation to three separate concrete subcontractors. Uh, They're going to price it based on their, uh, often they're going to price it based or, or their prices can be influenced by how busy they are. If they're extremely loaded up, they're going to price it high because it's going to be more work, you know, that they don't necessarily need, and they're going to price it high. If 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 they're only modestly busy, they're gonna they're gonna price it in the middle. If they're if they're for whatever particular reason hungry for work at that moment, they're gonna price it lean. And, mm. and so. I do think it's a fair process for contractors and subcontractors to go through a bidding process. It is, it is a lot of work, (laughs) but it's fair. And, uh, I do, uh, now often get the opportunity to be Mm pre-selected without bidding. Um, it may be I have a track history with that particular architect, or it may be I have a track history with that particular client. Uh, a lot of my clients are, are return clients. Uh, they, they have multiple projects. Uh, and that's nice too. And then that's often, uh, since we are talking about the business of architecture, um, sometimes it's based on a fixed fee. Right. Or sometimes it, it's based on a, a GMAX you know, control estimate. Um, just the fact that you're selected uh, with no competition to work on a project rarely means it's uh, that you can price it as you wish. Uh, yeah. I don't know anybody that isn't concerned about the, the cost of construction. And uh, I recommend all my clients know where they're going to end up before they start. It, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, the uh, running a, a, a kind of general contracting business is it appears very complicated um, it actually seems a lot more complex in many ways than, say, the the, uh, the design services where we're kind of, you know, we're, we're commissioned to do part of the project. And then the what you're doing is, you're, you know, you're kind of coordinating lots of different teams. You're going into the complexities of subcontractors. There's an enormous amount of legal responsibilities that are, that are happening. How would you... How, how would you map out your business if you were to explain it to someone who had no idea about how it works? Well, it, it's really, <clears throat> I couldn't do it on my own. It's a team. It's yeah. a huge team effort. I have 20 full-time employees. Most of them have been with me in excess of 15 or 20 years. Right. Um, and uh, that team includes superintendents. I have uh, three or four qualified superintendents, three or four qualified project managers. I have a, an amazing office staff, an amazing uh, office manager. Um, I have skilled labor that's been with me for 30 years. Um, and, uh, and I've got a good lawyer. I've got an excellent lawyer who, um, who practices the art of, of language and preciseness, uh, uh, which is very important uh, when you're when you're contracting. You, you mm. want to be precise, you, and you want to be correct, and you want to be logical, and you want it built on on reason. Mm. Uh, so, I it it doesn't seem difficult to me. You know, I don't know how someone could sit down at the piano and imagine it a tune out of thin air. Uh, But I suspect that they have their uh, system and it works for them. And uh, this works really well for me. We know when we're handed a set of plans, we know what to do with it from, from decades of practice. 
it goes to the estimator, you know, and then it goes to the uh, uh, superintendent and the project manager for comments. And, and then it goes to the attorney for contract. So it's a, it's a system that's, that's not amazing to me in any way, shape or form. Mm. Uh, it's just a good team, the basics of any good business. Brilliant. Um, you've, you've got a lot of uh, a, quite a diverse portfolio of work of different styles of houses and i know in in los angeles you have you have companies that will specialize in certain stylistic types do you um have you ever gone into a niche or how have you managed to maintain a diversity uh the only niche i've gone into is that i i try to stick to residential right um uh for whatever reason uh and it probably has a lot to do with starting with Howard Boris, but uh, for whatever reason, residential has been my forte. Mm -hmm. And um, I decided early on to just try to focus on being the best at what I was doing, not necessarily the biggest. Yeah. Uh, And um, there's a lot of um, uh, distractions along the way. Uh, I I know a lot of my colleagues, uh, they, they develop homes, they, they, they buy properties, and on the side, they're, they're building homes to flip. Uh, I stayed away from all of that. I just focused uh, on working for um, the client. And uh, I've had a lot of tele- television opportunities along the way. Um, uh, and there's been a lot of that but I've always thought it would be tough to explain to my client uh, why their house wasn't getting done on time yet. Here I was on TV finishing a remodel for a television show. So I've avoided that. Uh, I've really just tried to focus on being the best uh, high end custom builder that I can. Mm. And it, it doesn't have a lot to do with being the best high end. It, it has more to do with being the best builder because I try not to focus on the size of a project or the price tag attached to a project. Uh, I've enjoyed a lot of much smaller projects. Uh, I'm just trying to align myself with good, creative, talented people. And uh, I've taken as many small jobs as I've taken large jobs, and it's been very rewarding. Mm. Uh, As far as uh, uh, architectural niches, Uh, I've done it all, and it's just sort of been the way that it's come to me. Uh, I've I've worked with a lot of uh, mid-century homes, uh, A. Quincy Jones, Ray Cappy. uh, A lot of people had projects that were uh, interesting, Uh, John Lautner. um, And then I've had a lot of traditional. I've done a lot of work uh, uh, in, in... traditional homes, uh, great architects like uh, Mark Appleton. Uh, and then I love modern and I've been yeah. blessed to work with a lot of uh, modern architects uh, such as Steve Ehrlich, uh, Takashi and I, uh, people like that, that have, that have focused on modern mm. or contemporary. And I like them all. I once had an architect say to me that, he wouldn't show my portfolio to anyone if I had a traditional home in there. It had to all be modern. But my experience with traditional has informed my experience with modern. Mm. I think if you don't go through the, uh, through the moldings and and the decorative elements of traditional, um, you're a little bit less informed when it comes to the uh, sleekness uh, of, of, of modern maybe sleek is the wrong word, but the cleanness of modern, the, yeah. the minimalism of modern. So to me, they all add to the overall education and I like them all. Yeah, uh, That's how that worked out. Well, what makes a, a, a good dynamic or a good successful relationship between you and the architect, both in, both in terms of like personalities, but also in terms of information? Well, it, I think it does have a lot to do with personalities. My experience in life is that you, 
you you click with some people and you don't click with others. And it, it, the people that you don't click with, it, it's it's nothing against them or yourself. It's just that certain personalities mesh better together. So I always look for a good relationship, a, 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 a natural affinity for the people that you're working with. Um, and then the from there, you go to the work product. So not only do you like architects that their personality meshes with you, you like architects and designers that communicate clearly what they're trying to build. And typically that's on paper. Yeah. Uh, so my favorite kind of architects are heavy on paper, uh, a lot of detail provided. Um, and that's what makes a job easier for me. I tell my clients, find a good architect. And for every hundred dollars or every thousand dollars that you spend on that architect, you will save money in the construction because the, the better that the plans are, are, are clear and, and precise and correct, the smoother the construction goes and, and the costs are minimal, minimal that way. When does it go wrong or when, when does it, when do you find yourself it not being a fit with both client and architect? Well, you know, every, every project you're, you're climbing into a boat with some other people and shoving off from shore and heading for the <laughs> opposite shore. And the quality of the journey is typically determined by the shipmates uh, and you don't know everybody at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, you, so I have been on journeys where um, you realize this is the wrong personality or the wrong situation. And um, but we tend to, if if we have a problem with an architect or a designer or a client our job is still to get them to the other shore. And um, so we just uh, hunker down, we remain professional and get the job completed. Uh, mm. Hopefully to everyone's uh, total satisfaction. What, what, what are your views on the amount of participation that an architect should have during construction, the actual construction phase? I prefer architects that are involved all the way through. Right because um, every house, uh, no matter how good the plans are, still requires a million decisions. And if the architect's involved, uh, you're typically gonna get a much more informed uh, uh, decision. So uh, I would say the majority of our jobs, the architects remain involved, um, typically attend the weekly meetings, uh, or at least are responsive whenever an RFI or a question goes out. Do you guys ever uh, involved in sort of design and build type contracts where the architect was no longer be involved or the, con or the architect then becomes novated to you? So you're now the architect's client, essentially. A small percentage of the work we do um, can end up that way. Um, uh, I love design. Uh, uh, I'd have to say I love design more than I love architecture uh, in that uh, I can't do architectural drawings myself. Right. So if, if, if a project requires architectural drawings, you want an architect involved. But if the project requires a decision about a color or uh, a certain massing or uh, I, I, I have opinions about good design mm -hmm. um, and I'm happy to give an opinion if I'm asked. Um, one of the interesting byproducts of being at this for so long is that when I walk into a house, I think I look at it differently than a normal person looks at it, you know, and especially yeah. if it's modern, uh, I can look around the room and, you know, when a room is designed and constructed correctly, it's just so obvious when, when it's good, good design or good quality or good architecture, 
it's a it's a powerful feeling. Mm. Uh, I, I'm fond of saying and I'm fond of repeating that it's like a it's like a good book or a good movie uh, or or some beautiful art. You 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 are you you are inspired by it, and that's why architecture and design are so important. Your homes should be an inspiration, and that's why I have job security because everyone walks into a house and they reimagine it in their own image. Yeah. Nobody walks into a house and is satisfied with the way it is. They would prefer the closet over there, or they would prefer the window there, or they would prefer the opening bigger. And there you have uh, lots of work for people like me. Mm. There will never be a shortage of renovation or new construction that I, that I could foresee <laughs> abundant, especially in a, such a large city as Los Angeles with so many interesting people and personalities. Um, in terms of, uh, you mentioned you have a, a kind of a legal department or a, a lawyer that works in the, in the business and the U S is famed as, as the UK, you know, being very litigious and construction obviously over the years, have you seen the, the construction industry become more and more litigious over the span of your career? And what, what are the sorts of things that typically cause those kinds of problems? Um, I've experienced very little litigation in my own career. Mm -hmm. uh, knock on wood. Um, really only one or two minor instances, what I would describe as minor instances. Um, what leads to litigation is people uh, or contractors being unreasonable. Right. Um, I think if you go into a disagreement and try to imagine where the other person is coming from, um, there's always a, there's always a meeting point or, or, or a happy medium. And that's what I look for. Um, I think that if you are a personality that just sees the world in a very rigid way and it's your way or the highway, you're going to get into those kind of situations. We always try to see the owner's position. Mm -hmm. We always try to take the owner's position if, if, if possible. Uh, and if not, um, there's a happy medium. So yeah. for me, it's about personalities, uh, when people become rigid and hardline and they're unwilling to compromise, it's going to end up in litigation. Um, I, uh, I have a rule that, that owners should only pay for things once. And um, that one rule has probably kept me out of trouble. Most of my <laughs> if owners realize that they're being treated with fairly, uh, they're reasonable. If they, think that they're being treated unfairly, they can become unreasonable. So um, I, I have a video on my website where I talk about, uh, I, I hired someone to do some work for me and it wasn't the amount of money that was important to me. It was the only thing that was important to me was, am I being treated fairly? Yeah. It was, it was a, a palpable feeling. I, I just remember lying awake at night. Is this guy ripping me off or am I being treated fairly? And, and I realized that that's how my clients must look at these projects, especially when they get into millions of dollars. So uh, I just try to treat people fairly and that's worked for me. Brilliant. How, how do you keep projects profitable? And what are the things that are the, the biggest indicators for making a loss on a project? Um, well, the biggest indicator for uh, making a, a loss is, is, is poor estimating. Right. If you underestimate a job, you're going to take a loss. Um, to be honest, I would say I take a loss or I break even on 30% of my jobs. Um, and um, I just try to realize that overall, uh, you know, uh, overall we are making a profit uh, mm -hmm. and you're just going to have some situations where you're not going to make a profit, you know, or, or, or 
or you're just going to break even. Um, and to me, it's never bothered me. It's never, it's, it's, it's not something that keeps me awake at night. Uh, yeah. Uh, generally, we estimate correctly. 66% of our jobs, generally, uh, if we estimate correctly, uh, we're going to make money. And uh, so I just try to look at the big picture and realize some things we underestimated. Some things were more difficult than we anticipated. Some things uh, we're just going to break even on or, mm -hmm. or even pay for a little bit of it. Uh, but overall, uh, we estimate correctly. Uh, Overall, we, 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 we bring it in on budget, on schedule, and overall, we make a, uh, an appropriate profit. Where are the biggest risks for you in, in a project typically? I think that the biggest risk for me and the client is coming out of the ground. Right. Because um, when you start a complicated foundation, there's, there's no way to truly anticipate everything that's going to happen with the geology. And uh, so you can, uh, for example, uh, we just uh, finished the foundation on a burn down in Malibu and uh, we ran into some old existing piles that were concrete piles that were, were not obvious uh, when we bid the job. And we have the appropriate clauses in our contract, but it took quite a bit of effort to jackhammer that concrete uh, out of the way so it wasn't interfering with the new the new footings and uh, that was an unknown it was just something from a, a previous home that had been there uh, and uh, uh, so coming out of the ground there's a lot there's typically is where we run into overages mm. um, other than that core and shell is pretty pretty tight most people can build the foundation the walls, the roof, the windows, uh, that could be bid pretty tightly. Uh, the finishes get a little trickier because um, unless everything is strictly selected ahead of time, there's a lot of room for movement. Uh, a fireplace mantle can go from a simple, uh, a fireplace opening can go from a simple uh, hearth and surround. Uh, it can go all the way up to a hand carved uh, limestone surround. So there's a difference between a $4,000 fireplace surround and a, a $40,000 fireplace yeah. surround. So in the finishes, unless everything is well selected ahead of time, uh, that can be a little tricky. Uh, in most contracts carry some allowances and finishes because everything hasn't been a hundred percent selected. But um, I, I would say uh, coming out of the ground and finishes are, are where the biggest risk is. Got it. Do, do you, when you receive a set of um, tender documentation from an architect, um, what's your process for identifying risks or what happens if there's not enough information or you feel like there's not enough information in the architect's drawings? Is that a red flag and to walk away from the project or? No, we, we typically RFI the, the, the architect for, for more information. For a homeowner, if you're looking at a bid, when you see the word allowance, that's a red flag. Right. That nobody's really sure of exactly what's being <laughs> called out here. Uh, so that's a quick and easy way to identify uh, a potential risk, the word allowance. Um, we try to keep that at a minimum, but uh, sometimes it's preferable. And sometimes that's at direction from the architect or the homeowner. We'll just make that an allowance. I'll decide later. When do you know when to say no to a project? Um, that's a tricky question. <laughs> uh, I once did a, a, a job for a well-known actress. And um, so I got to know this person slightly and sort of saw uh, her decision-making process. And mm. I sort of came to the realization that her career was successful, not as much based on the movies as she selected. It was as much to do with the movies she rejected. Mm. And um, I just, that was just sort of a weird oblique lesson that I learned from this one particular person. 
and I started looking at jobs in the context of, will this help me and advance me? And likewise for the client, or is this being taken for the wrong reason? So it's a difficult question to answer. I've turned down a lot of jobs. I've, I've, I've been involved in a couple of jobs where I walked away. Uh, it's typically if somebody comes into the process that I think is detrimental to the process, then I'll, I'll hopefully um, and politely remove myself from the situation. Um, when I see personalities that aren't contributing or that are creating drama or yeah. that um, are not going to make it a success, mm. that's when I would um, um, gracefully, gracefully decline. It, it seems that uh, with a, with a, with a, when you're building something, it's quite difficult to get yourself out of a job that's not going to be a fit, if you like. So if you, once, you've, once you've made that first hole in the ground, is it easy to remove that yourself from the project? It's much easier to extract yourself before actual construction begins. Yeah. Uh, but for me, once actual construction begins, I'm committed. Right. I'm 100% committed. And then it's just a matter of, uh, if it, then it just becomes a matter of dealing with uh, an unpleasant personality or, or having to accept somebody else's point of view over mine. Uh, yeah. But, but once we lay our hands on the project, I am committed to finish that project. Yeah. Now, you can't extract yourself. <laughs> now, you, you work with a, a particular caliber of client, shall we say. Um, very successful, either in you know in in film, in entertainment, or in business, as you were as you were saying. What are some of the lessons that you've learned? You just shared some just then. Are there any other lessons that you've learned from working with people who have kind of accomplished a lot or have been successful in their respective careers that have influenced your own business? Well, I I think as you go through life, you meet people and you 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 learn valuable lessons from people and 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 course that's happened to me too i would just have to say that um even though people are successful business leaders or they're successful in the entertainment industry uh they're still just you're dealing with their home <laughs> you're dealing with their their heart uh I think a, a contractor is important to a person as a, a doctor or a financial advisor. Uh, you're dealing with what is closest and dearest to them. You're in their lives. Um, you're affecting their lives, their children. Uh, so I just, uh, I just think that people are people, no matter how successful they are, they're people. And what's important to them is their family and mm -hmm. their space. And I just try to realize that, respect it, and, and give them uh, the best that I can give them. Beautiful. Um, in terms of how you win work and marketing, um, how, how has that evolved over, the, over your 30-year career or 30 years of uh, post? Well, it's funny. Like I said, when we started with the Northridge earthquake, we had no lack of work when we started. I teamed up with a, a partner. Uh, he, he's retired now, but uh, I started with a partner and the phone started ringing and one thing led to another. Um, and we, I would have to say that I paid very little attention to advertising uh, all the way uh, I started in the 90s. I didn't pay attention to advertising until 2008. 2008 was the great credit crunch. Uh, and one day the phone just stopped ringing. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. It was like <laughs> one day it was ringing off the hook and the next day it just, there was nothing. And uh, everybody went through that and knows what I mean. Uh, restaurants were empty and, and, and you know, uh, and I realized that I, um, needed to advertise because the market share had grown smaller. Uh, but the bigger revelation that I had was that I should have been advertising when things were good because 
really advertising is just branding. You know, it's just having people think of you when they think of construction. So Coca-Cola doesn't advertise because sales are, are bad. Coca-Cola advertises because they're branding their name. They're putting their name out there so that when people get thirsty, they think of Coke. Terrible example, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but true. Uh, and I realized that, uh, that I needed to focus on getting my name out there and my images out there. And uh, I hired a, a wonderful publicist, uh, communication arts, and uh, she helped me, Christine Anderson helped me uh, put together a, a program of uh, print advertising and uh, uh, panel discussions and media events, uh, just so that, you know, take the, take the bushel off the light, let people see your light, you know, let it shine. And um, uh, I always preferred buying ads over seeking editorial because I had no control over editorial. Uh, but if I were to buy a, a back cover or an inside cover on the front of uh, design magazines, uh, I could control the message. Mm. And uh, we put a lot of effort into our images and into our message. And um, I don't think that anyone's ever called me and said, hey, I saw a house you did in this magazine and, and uh, I want you to build my house. But it made the design community and the architectural community aware of who we were. And uh, then when I did meet people at industry events, they had had some exposure to me and they knew who they were talking to. So I just think now that advertising is very important, just so that people know who you are and what you represent and the type of work that you do. And uh, we're very focused on it nowadays. Uh, we have plenty of work. We don't do it because we need work. We do it because it's uh, part of the message that needs to be out there. How do you um, navigate working with certain clients obviously and you you know you're, you're subject to lots of non-disclosure agreements and you're working with um people who have got a high profile in the in the media etc and often those types of clients will ask you not to publish photographs or share images of their houses how do you na navigate around that because that's quite you know in many ways that's a sort of a real key marketing asset if you like that you're not able to share with the world in many ways. It is a, it is a bit of an obstacle. Uh, probably 70% of the work that we've done, the great work that we've done, we're not able to show. Yeah. We're not able to put it into our ads <laughs> or into our social media. Uh, but I have had 30% of the projects that I've done where the clients uh, have been very gracious in letting us use uh, images of their, uh, their homes. And uh, I just keep recycling what we're allowed to do, you know. Uh, and um, so I just, you just have to live with it. But if, if you sign an NDA, it's a no-no. We're, yeah. we're very strict about, I don't post anything on, on my Instagram or uh, on my website that, that I don't have express permission for because um, it's a big a big no-no so mm. privacy is very important to a lot of my clients and we just recognize that and, and we just deal with it we, we live mm -hmm. with it then occasionally we get clients uh robert downey jr and uh, susan downey uh jr recently uh, uh we're proud of a, a project we did with them and um and it was a uh, they're very environmental. They're doing a lot of environmental improvements to their home. And they wanted to highlight some of those. And they went out and published it. And they called us out in public. And that was very welcome to me that, that, that we could do such an interesting, creative project and then uh, have someone of their stature come out and acknowledge it. Uh, so um, a lot of obstacles, but a lot of uh, good, generous people helping us along the way also. Amazing. 
Brilliant. And what's, um, well, I was, I was going to ask, obviously we've, we've just gone through a, a global pandemic and you mentioned there about the recession of 2008. Obviously the business has been going from, from the 90s. So you've weathered, a, you've weathered a few recessions. What have been some of your lessons learned from how to weather a recession? Uh, keep your overhead down. Um, pay attention to your overhead. Uh, that's the most important thing. Uh, I would like everybody in my company to have new trucks and <laughs> new tools and uh, uh, new computers. Uh, but as in any business, you have to watch the overhead. You have to keep it at, at a minimal. Uh, the pandemic uh, affected us, uh, but we were able to keep going. We stopped for a week or two uh, so I could order all of the protective materials that we needed. I had to order them all from China. And once we had all the protective materials being uh, uh, masks and uh, personal protection uh, equipment, uh, we were right back at it. And uh, we had a stringent program of uh, monitoring temperatures, of uh, distancing people, of wearing masks. And uh, we didn't have any... Uh, 20 employees and a couple of hundred subcontractors, we had very little problems with the COVID. Kept everybody uh, healthy and uh, thank God it's over. <laughs> Absolutely. It was it we're annoying. Did it, did it have a, a big impact on, on a lot of the construction contracts and the, and the prices of things? Um, it did. Things Things did slow down. People took a, a pause and uh, things slowed down, but the projects that we had started had to continue and the, the clients uh, did continue. Um, so I would say that uh, that year was a, a lean year, but it certainly wasn't a loss. Yeah. And uh, we've since then, we've ramped back up to full production. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation this morning. And just want to say thank you very much for sharing your expertise and your insights and a kind of behind the scenes, if you like, of, of uh, all coast construction. I appreciate the opportunity. I maybe uh, it, it gives me a chance to uh, uh, show my daughters later in life what I used to do. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. My pleasure. Thank you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.